The Michael Hatfield Remax team presents Real Estate and More. Bay Area real estate is different than in all of America. And why? What's up with home buyers? What's on sellers' minds? How is the market? And much, much more. Now, here's your host, Michael Hatfield. Welcome to the Real Estate and More show. I'm your host, Michael Hatfield. Our veterans. This show honors the men and women in uniform who serve or have served our great country in our armed forces. Before we interview our special guest, I would like to share a story about one such group of our country's defenders who served more than 80 years ago. This story is called The Heart of the Flying Tiger. Long ago, as part of our country's aviation history, preceding World War II, the volunteer fighter group called the Flying Tigers was sent to protect defenseless Chinese villagers from strafing and bombing by the enemy's pilots. The story of the American volunteer group, the Flying Tigers, is most remarkable, but is not the subject this morning. However, my story is related to these amazing fighter pilots from a time in our history some 83 years ago. While reclining in a comfortable chair in the birthing lounge, awaiting the arrival of our granddaughter, suddenly the awesome sound of a baby's life-giving heartbeat filled the room. Swoosh, swoosh, swoosh. And I closed my eyes and considered the miracle of life as seen looking at the eyes of the baby through use of advanced ultrasound technology. While lounging in the chair, it was easy enough to reflect on how wonderful the beginning of life truly is, and at the same time realize just how totally dependent a baby is on its mother, who can become a very fierce tiger, by the way, if you threaten her offspring. My mind continued to drift further away to people who are unable to defend themselves against harm from external ruffians and ruthless enemies. A few weeks back, while looking at real estate properties for sale, the need for a pit stop facilitated a quick drop in to a local McDonald's restaurant. It is ironic how the darndest things may bring forth an unforeseen opportunity. Today revealed such an astonishing event. After personal business was complete and I was rushing from the restaurant like a first responder to a fire, out of the corner of my eye I noticed an elderly gentleman sitting quietly enjoying his meal. This sight was not so remarkable, but what was remarkable and drew my attention was the writing on the baseball cap that he was wearing. My gradual realization of the stature of the man began with the flying tiger emblem and more noteworthy founder imprinted on the bill of his hat. The revelation came to me in slow motion. Flying Tigers, founder, elderly, it all came together in a heartbeat. I was looking directly at a genuine American hero. His hair was gray, his eyes were blue, but still surprisingly full at his advanced age of life. He sat with an air of confidence of a man who has just about seen it all. A stubble or two left on his face where he had missed in the morning's shave. His blue eyes were as striking and clear as they were friendly. When I thanked him for his service and offered to pay for his lunch, a smile broke out on his face along with an increased brilliance to those blue eyes that portrayed his true kind spirit of heart. I introduced myself as a fellow pilot, and upon introduction to, we'll call him LC, we spoke a while of the P-40 fighter airplanes in which he flew missions over the China Hump, protecting villagers just before and during the start of World War II. For a moment, I could tell his mind had drifted back to a time in life when he was hanging it all out, protecting Chinese farmers and villagers. L.C. and I spoke about another Flying Tiger pilot, a mentor of mine, T.C., a friend and big supporter of yours truly who sadly passed away just a few years ago. As it turned out, L.C. actually flew with T.C. in the Flying Tiger's American Volunteer Group. Amazingly, L.C. sported the same pencil-width mustache that my old friend T.C. wore 
and he was able to accurately describe my old tiger pilot friend TC in detail. Awaiting the birth of my granddaughter, I considered Elsie's words describing the defenseless nature of the villagers on the ground back then and how exposed they were to relentless and ruthless enemy who strafed them, killing so many. Elsie confirmed Chinese villagers at the time sewn a patch on the back of the flight jackets of the flying tigers that said something to the nature of whoever finds this man needing help, hide him and care for him with your life as he is a friend and protector of our Chinese villagers or something like that. In my book, anyone who risks his life protecting others, especially others who are virtually defenseless against a formidable and ruthless enemy are worthy of my deep appreciation and admiration. Our United States military veterans are a distinct part of this category. Even a grown up at times can find himself caught up and defenseless against life's ruthless forces and may need help from others, like a baby in the womb, a person less fortunate, a farmer in a small village in China so very long ago. Hearing the labored sound of my granddaughter's first cry, I opened my eyes and my heart skipped a beat as I began to be so excited about this miracle of a little baby. Excited, however concerned, as I watched enthusiastically baby taking her first breath and looking around trustingly at her exciting new world. She, as dependent now as she was in the womb, will require help and support until she can make it all on her own. But really now, do any of us ever really make it entirely all on our own? We need our village, each one of us. We have life's heroes with hearts of tigers, people like mothers, fathers, and veteran fighter pilots like LC to lend a hand. We need our men and women in uniform in our U.S. military, and today is their day. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. Welcome to the Real Estate Minute with REMAX expert, Michael Hatfield. Michael, why choose an experienced agent? Complex issues arise in a home buy or sell. Your agent guides you through issues in multiple offer situations, first time home buyer needs, problems with inspections, financing, and escrow. Experienced agents sort and then solve problems. Do agents work differently now than in prior years? Buyers used to go to an office, thumb through a book, see pictures, then decide which homes to see. Nowadays, buyers identify properties themselves online so today's agent can focus on more critical priorities. How do you help clients, Michael? We work with investment properties, multiple offers, first-time home buyers, sellers, 1031 tax exchanges, and relocations. Experience is pivotal. Call 925-322-7775 now to schedule an appointment or complimentary home analysis. Call the Michael Hatfield Remax team at 925-322-7775 or go to michaelhatfieldhomes.com. Now, back to our show. Well, welcome back to the Real Estate and More show. I'm Michael Hatfield. We value our veterans. No show about veterans can be complete without talking with one. I have today a very special veteran who has been there and done that. He is a retired deputy operations commander, a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force, retired. He has served in our military in Afghanistan as an F-16 fighter pilot, and he has flown many missions and is an absolute great guy. A guy, as my ancestors would say, a man to ride the river with. He is willing to be gracious and share some of his experiences in the Air Force with us. Welcome to the show, Lieutenant Colonel. Colonel Andrew. Good to be here, Mike. Uh, Mr. Veteran, we're pleased to have you with us. Could you please share with us uh, what your military career was like? Well, I started kind of oddly. I was in the University of Illinois and Air Force ROTC under a scholarship to be an engineer in the Air Force. Uh, and that's when, uh, just as I was graduate, uh, Reagan, of course, uh, ended up his eight-year term and uh, the military started with large cutbacks. 
So instead of being an engineer in the uh, Air Force, uh, I ended up being a, an F-4 backseater in the Air National Guard. I uh, went to a unit in Illinois, actually. Uh, they soon converted into uh, F-16s. And all those F-4 guys, the backseaters, ended up in Terre Haute, Indiana. And so what they did is they took us all and sent us all to pilot training. So I actually went to pilot training as kind of an experienced fighter guy. I uh, did pilot training, F-16 training. I did a couple years at Terre Haute and then went on active duty for about a three-year stint. I uh, started out Kunsan, Korea and F-16s and then Hill Air Force Base. I uh, decided it was time to get out and uh, went to the Guard in Toledo, Ohio, which I really enjoyed. Um, soon after, Brand X Airlines got the airline job of my dreams. I got furloughed <laughs> after 9-11, which you all know. Uh, mm-hmm. Ended up coming back to Hill Air Force Base where I was in the reserve and served out my last 10 years uh, as an F-16 pilot instructor, senior examiner on base. Uh, had a really good career, 26 years of flying, never left the cockpit. So uh, I, I, I was very blessed. You know, the F-16 has been one of our most ad- more advanced fighters. Uh, yeah, you know, there's always newer and better, but uh, only a few pilots are selected out of training to fly this equipment. And your discussion about how you got into the uh, front seat of the F-16 was pretty interesting. For me, it was kind of plain dumb luck that it ended up that way. But uh, other people in the Air Force now have to compete to fly a fighter aircraft. And, you know, now you have F-35s and F-22s, pretty highly technological machines uh, versus what we had in the F-4 and definitely the F-16, uh, legacy F-16s that I flew to begin with. Wow. Must have been one heck of an experience to fly a high-performance airplane like that. I I can't say that I've flown much of a more high-performance airplane than an empty 767. <laughs> yeah, that's right. They climb a lot higher. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the F-16, what, is, what does it feel like to be in that? And have you ever had a live engagement? Uh, yeah, mostly, you know, when we deployed to Afghanistan and Iraq, you know, supporting troops in contact. Uh, never an air-to-air one. When I was there in Iraq, we did uh, one guy did shoot down an Iranian drone. Yeah, uh, amazing machine. I mean, the F-16 was designed as a, a lightweight uh, kind of day VFR fighter, uh, and it slowly progressed into all kinds of attachments. Uh, flying it clean with no ordnance on it is just an amazing experience. It looks like a Lamborghini. Um, and then when you start putting tanks and bombs and missiles on it, it, it turns into a Mack truck. So still lots of power, but it's a lot fun, more fun flying when it's clean. Yeah. And, you know, the, the important thing is you want to go fast if someone on the ground, an enemy is shooting at you. Yeah. And, and want to be high. Uh, yeah. especially. Unfortunately, I think, you know, our latest threats were, you know, how many years in Iraq and Afghanistan where there really was no substantial air, th- air threat and anyone shooting at you from the ground that's going to touch you. Uh, so it's kind of led us in a false sense of security. And now you see... Future airplanes like the F-35, F-22 are now stealth-based, something to give you advantages over those uh, threats now that we may face in the future with China, Russia, or whoever that may be. Yeah, yeah. Would you, you um, when you strapped into that, what did it feel like? We both know what it feels like when you get into an airliner and you have a lot of people in the back, but when you strap into something of that nature, of that high performance, you know, just uh, just thinking about some of those uh, hang 10 departures that the guys did out of Honolulu ahead of us before our departure, you know, they would go straight up, absolutely straight up a short time after departure must have been really quite a feeling to fly that. Yeah, the acceleration is pretty impressive. I mean, you know, in an airliner, you're what, maybe 180, 200 knots at the end of the runway. Uh, F-16, you're probably 450 in a full afterburner takeoff in a clean airplane. Uh, The one thing about the F-16 is there's no graceful way to get into it. So you kind of like climb up the ladder and sit your butt down and kind of scoot it in. It's it's kind of embarrassing when you do it. Uh, People ask me. (laughs) It's not like you just walk in and, you know, in the F-4, we just stood on the seat. But, you know, an F-16 is like, oh, no, wait, it's uh, it's, it's too too gentle for that. But, uh, yes, in fact, I just flew with a guy who converted from the F-18 to the F-16. He was asking me, so how? what's the best way to get in? I'm like, well... You just got to do it. Yeah. <laughs> get a shoe, get a shoehorn. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a very, very tight cockpit. Um, it, you know, the seat reclines about 25 degrees, but once you get in, it's very comfortable. 
uh, you feel at home. There's not a lot of room to maneuver around, but you really don't need to because everything's on either the stick or the throttle that you need to manipulate with a few buttons on screens and stuff. You mentioned the stick. It's what to the left side of the the pilot, and you just very delicately touch it to to change your your flight attitude. Correct? Yeah, it's on the right side actually. Uh, hmm. So you you fly as an FO, I guess, in, in your world. Uh, yeah, it moves about a sixteenth of an inch. Uh, it's all pressure on it, and it's pretty much you think you know you want to turn that direction in it. What is the big difference between an F sixteen and an F eighteen? F eighteen, of course, is a uh, carrier based airplane. A uh, lot of, you know, with uh, landings uh, on a carrier, the extreme structure is needed, a heavier gear. Uh, the tail hook, I mean, is is a big piece of metal. It's it's attached to a lot of, of the frameage of the airplane. And F-16 does have a tail hook. Uh, the F-18 guys make fun of it. They call it was made by Mattel. Uh, an F-16 can take a, a, a approaching cable or a departure cable, but it doesn't take it well. It will cause some damage to the airplane. Uh, but it's kind of a survival uh, mode, not a regular operation mode when it comes to flying the airplane. I see. I see. What was your most memorable experience flying the F-16 abroad? I, I got to say my first flight. I mean, when I sat in the F-4, you never felt anything. You know, the, the airplane started up and, you know, flight controls. And the F-16, everything starts shaking. The air, uh, as the uh, motor starts spinning, the hydraulics come alive and the flight controls start banging around and, you're taxiing along and you can see the wing bouncing up and down. You're like, wow, <laughs> is this thing really going to work? Uh, and then you take off and you're like, you ratchet with the stick once and you're like, this is awesome. This thing is made for, for flying. I, really can only, I can only imagine. I can only imagine. Now, so your support crew, um, my brother was in the Air Force and he years and years ago and he was stationed in Japan and uh, he was always kind of a little bit of a, of a hellraiser, pardon the word. Yeah. Um, and he had worked on an airplane as a mechanic. And uh, the pilot came out and uh, he said, uh, Airman, is this uh, airplane ready to fly? And my brother would said, yes. And he said, would you bet your life on it? And my brother responded and said, no, oh, I'm going to bet yours. I think, he <laughs> lost, right. I, think, I think he lost a stripe over that one. But uh, tell us about your ground support crew and the guys and the, the, the ladies that, that helped with that. Uh, it's, it's amazing, you know, seeing the people working on those airplanes. Uh, you know, as a pilot, you, you see the end product. Uh, but, you know, some of the young airmen uh, and senior airmen and senior people that I knew, especially in the reserve and guard, were just awesome. Uh, in fact, uh, we had a pilot in Toledo, uh, female, and she was an ex-crew chief and then became a pilot. And she was just outstanding to go cross country with and take the airplane places because you'd be like looking at this leak and go, hey, is this supposed to leak? And she'd go, oh, yeah, no problem. She'd wipe it, clean it. She'd do the forms, uh, fuel the airplane. It, it was really impressive. <laughs> she, she loved what she was doing. She really did. Yeah, she really did. It's uh, it was it was good to see as a as a young lieutenant that she was grow up into, you know, a flight lead and an instructor and uh, move on. But uh, she definitely had a great background. And I can't say enough about the, you know, the people that worked on those airplanes. I may ha I had one really serious problem in my entire 26 year career. So that says a lot, uh, you know, how the airplane was designed, how it was maintained. Um, all the way from people working on the ground to fueling it all the way to the depot level maintenance when they, you know, do huge modifications to the airplane and um, make sure it's, uh, you know, keeping ready to fly for the next, you know, 20 plus years. What what was that serious problem? Can you, can you share it with us? Uh, yeah, I was, uh, you know, a great sunny fall day. Get a call. Hey, we need someone to fly with this young guy. Got Look it. out for those great sunny days. Yeah, they're great too. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, go to the range, really sharp uh, young wingman. Uh, he's going through his qualification program. Uh, we come back to the pattern and uh, do a couple pattern works. I put the gear down and it's kind of like a, you know, an airliner. You get uh, a light and a handle comes on and a light and handle goes off when the gear's down and, and along with indications. So I put the gear down and I get uh, a nose, a left main, no right main light. And there's a light in the handle, which indicates that the gear is not down and locked by two systems. Um, and so I've got about 20 minutes of fuel to figure out what we're going to do with this. And so we have a 1-800 number to Lockheed. 
And there's a guy on the ground that I'm talking to, and he's talking to the engineers at Lockheed going, hey, here's this problem. You know, what do we do with it? And I'm following the checklist. And basically, the checklist says you're going to take a approach in cable. And if conditions aren't um, good to land or you have some doubts or a high cross, when it's go out to the controlled bailout area and inject out of the airplane. So it's like, okay, <laughs> that's, that's great. Uh, so I end up by taking the approach and cable, the, the gear ends up collapsing immediately after I take it, as soon as I land. Uh, of course, I come to a stop. The airplane is about maybe about two inches from the edge of the runway. And I open the canopy and I, as fast as I can, to the nearest fireman who just grabs me and, and throws me in the fire truck. Uh, it ends up being uh, a, a maintenance issue with the airplane. Uh, the gear had been misrigged during some time in its career, and I was the lucky guy when it actually, the bolt broke after so many, I think it was seven years ago, it had been rigged. So for seven years, it was always stretching this bolt, and I, I got lucky, lucky enough to fly that uh, seven-year-and-one-day sortie yeah. uh, to get it to break. And, and the good thing about the F-16 is it knew if you did eject what your situation was, were you low altitude on the ground? Uh, you were, were you high altitude, were you very fast and low and it would change the modes to, uh, better suit you as far as, uh, you know, opening shocks and whether you needed to shoot right away, or if you had to wait, uh, till you got to a lower altitude. Hmm. Tell me about the, the actual camaraderie that you had with people that were deployed and working together in the same operation. I mean, isn't that really something that we remember? I know retired from the airline business. I miss the people, something fierce. I do too. Uh, you know, especially after 26 years, I, I really, really enjoyed my last assignment as a reservist where we were in active duty squadrons flying with young people again. Uh, you know, as a traditional reservist, you're flying around with a bunch of lieutenant colonels that don't listen. You know, they're grumpy old men. Uh, but flying with the young folks is just awesome. Guys and gals are really, really impressed. I mean, from where I was as a young person to where they are now is just leaps and bounds uh, when it comes to the, you know, the technology advance, what they know, how they how they act. Um, and it, I find it actually really frustrating. You know, I run some parts of our family business now and I have to deal with my my brothers. And, you know, I can look at a lieutenant in the Air Force and go, I need this done and it's done. I, I yell at my brothers back and forth for months to get things done. Yeah. What was your favorite assignment and base in the military? I, I really enjoyed uh, Kunsan, Korea. So Kunsan is uh, on the west side of Korea, uh, right along the shore. I took it. It's a one-year remote assignment where your family doesn't come. My wife's father at the time did live in Korea, so we spent about six months together. But it was like college where alcohol was really cheap, and you got to fly up <laughs> for fun, and you made a lot of money. And, you know, everyone's in the same situation. You're reduced to 600 pounds of your favorite stuff that gets shipped over, uh, whether that's a bike or a computer uh, and we just had a really good time, really good squadron. Uh, some of my closest friends to this day, I served with in Korea that I can talk to. And it was flying was, uh, on the, the rock, we called it. Uh, all you had was VFR on top. You would talk to an approach control. And after that, you could go pretty much whatever you wanted to, as long as you didn't fly over Seoul or fly into North Korea. So, uh, it was really a, an enjoyable experience and mm -hmm. mostly young people there. Uh, a lot of young guys right out of training. So it was really fun to fly with them. Uh, wow. And we got to deploy to Alaska for a month. This is the first time I saw green vegetables in about eight months. <laughs> so <laughs> it was uh, it was really enjoyable. I look back at that as probably one of the funnest years of my life. If you were to, would you do it all over again? Would you be a military fighter pilot? You know, I, I was telling my wife that yesterday. I, I would put a quarter in and do it again, just as I did it. Uh, few things I may change, uh, but, uh, you know, meeting my wife and having to deal with her or not deal with her, but we've been married now for <laughs> years, right? Yeah, and deal so with her, understand. It, it's amazing when I look back, you know, when I, I first met her, you know, as a young lieutenant in the O club, you know, it's, and uh, we've really had a good experience together. It's been awesome with two, two great kids. I can't, wouldn't change a thing. Sound like you're grateful, my friend. What do you miss most about the military now that you're retired? I think just the camaraderie, uh, you know, being in the squadron every day, the professionalism, 
Um, you know, I get I get that a little bit in the airlines, but never to the degree that we had, uh, you know, in a fighter squadron. Everyone was very, very hard charging, hardworking. You know, 12 to 14 hour days on active duties were kind of the norm when you were especially deployed. Uh, and, you know, just working with people that were the same level of seriousness when it came to doing the job, uh, which was really neat. Uh, very, very neat. A very, very great experience in my life. Boy, I imagine your heartbeat would be moving like crazy when you're sitting there on alert and they, they call you up and you get in that airplane and uh, when you're deployed, of course. And yeah, I just would exactly. imagine your your heart rate would probably went up to 200, 200 beats a minute jumping in yeah. and strapping into that. Um, that well, fighter. it was amazing. Uh, you know, like in Afghanistan, uh, the army guys that we supported at one time showed up in the squadron to talk to us. And they thought we were like rock stars. Now, on a serious note, and knowing that some do not actually return from deployments, and they they don't they don't come home, maybe we have some thoughts on how we can help some of the brothers and sisters who served, who've returned home, and need that help. Yeah, I can say that. Uh, you know, when I retired from the the military, I was really not knowing much about the VA and disability benefits. Uh, since then, I, I have got an education on it and use that to help other people, uh, Vietnam vets, especially. Uh, and, uh, I can't say enough to, for, for veterans to go to the VA. I mean, we've all got hearing issues. Uh, you know, us, us fighter pilots got back neck issues to file with the VA and there's lots of help out there. I mean, my state right now, Utah has state employees, that will literally help you fill out the forms, help you get your medical records to send that stuff in. And the disability benefits are, are pretty significant. Uh, a friend of mine that was a VA vet, um, a Vietnam vet, uh, I work with him. Uh, when he started out, he had no disability whatsoever. And after we got done filing and all the admin stuff the Air Force used taught me to do, uh, now applying to the VA about three months ago, we got him to 100% disability, which was well-deserved uh, for his Agent Orange exposure. Uh -huh. And it changed his life, absolutely changed his life. And just seeing that and people like, hey, you should do this as a business. You should charge people. Absolutely not. Uh, just to see people change and, and that rewarding thing is well worth it to me, much more than money could ever buy. I just... Um... So happy that you have taken the time to share with us and our listeners today. Thank you so much, Lieutenant Colonel Andrew, USAF retired. I have a deep and personal appreciation for the men and women who serve and have served. Thank you, all of you, for being part of what makes this country great. And thank you, Lieutenant Colonel Andrew, for being on the show today. Our time honoring our men and women in uniform has been very special. From the story of the Flying Tiger and most especially our time with Lieutenant Colonel Andrew, it's time for a short break. You've been listening to Real Estate and More. Please remember to go to our new YouTube handle, My Real Talk Show. That's My Real Talk Show at YouTube.com and touch that subscribe button. You can also find past aired shows at our handle, My Real Talk Show, on YouTube.com. Important topics like Bay Area real estate and interesting people. I'm your host, Michael Hatfield. We'll be back shortly with our next special guest. Stay tuned.